Hi, class, and welcome to chapter 13. This chapter um, has five parts to it, and we'll take two lectures. Um, so this chapter, we're going to break uh, the peripheral nervous system's links from and to the world outside to our body. And it consists of all neural structures outside of the brain and spinal cord that can be broken down into these four parts, sensory receptors and reception, transmission lines, so their nerves and their structure and repair, motor endings and motor activities, and the reflex activity. These are some of the parts that we'll study um, all in chapter 13. So if we break down our um, organization of the nervous system down into the peripheral nervous system, and that's what we're going to focus on in this chapter, uh, we can break the peripheral nervous system down into your sensory division that takes in all senses and stimuli. And then the other half is the motor or efferent division. So we call the sensory the input, and then the motor efferent division, the output. And the motor division can be uh, broken down into the somatic, an autonomic nervous system, and then your autonomic surface system, nervous system can be broken down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic division. And we're going to really focus um, on the peripheral nervous system, this motor part. So your sensory receptors and sensation, uh, survival of anyone depends on the ability to sense things, whether that's a change in your internal or external environment. So being aware of a stimulus and perception um, has to do with the fact that your brain can interpret the meaning of that stimulus. The somatosensory system is part of the sensory system from external receptors, proprioceptors, and interceptors. The input is always relayed toward your head, but processed along the way. The levels of neural integration in sensory systems. We have a receptor. Your level are the sensory receptors. The circuit level is the processing and the ascending pathways. And then the perceptual level is the processing in the cortical sensory areas in the cerebrum, the brain itself. So here's the processing at the receptor level. Um, in order to generate a signal, so for sensation to occur, the stimulus must excite some sort of receptor and the action potential must reach your central nervous system. The stimulus energy must match the receptor specificity. So for example, uh, your touch receptors do not respond to light. St the stimulus must also be applied within a receptive field, which is an area of receptor monitors. The smaller the field, the more accurate the location of stimulus by the brain and transduction must occur. And this just means that the energy of the stimulus must be converted into a graded potential called a generator potential or receptor potential. And the graded potentials must reach threshold for your neurons to transmit the signal down. Adaptation is the change in sensitivity in the presence of constant stimulus. So your receptor membrane, membranes will become less responsive and the receptor potentials will decline in frequency or actually stop. And we have two types of receptors that respond to adaptation. A phasic receptor is fast adapting. This will send signals at the beginning or end of the stimulus. An example, your receptors for pressure, touch, and smell. And your tonic receptors adapt slowly or not at all. And examples of these are nociceptors or pain receptors and most proprioceptors. Processing at the circuit level, so then we get to our first, second, and third order neurons, which will um, take the stimulus toward the cerebrum or the central nervous system in order to process the signal um, to elicit some sort of response. Um, so the interpretation of sensory input depends on the specific location. So they're able to project to the exact point in the cortex activated always linked to the activation of the same sensory neuron. A aspects of sensory perception, um, perceptual detection is the ability to detect a stimulus. Magnitude estimation is where the intensity coded in frequency of the impulses. And then spatial discrimination has to do with identifying the site or the pattern of the stimulus. And then feature abstraction, 
quality discrimination and pattern recognition are more processing um, at the perceptual level, whether that has to do with taste or melodies of music. So the perception of pain warns of actual or impending tissue damage um, are, are helpful because they help to protect in case you need to take some sort of action. The stimuli include extreme pressure and temperature. The impulses will travel on fibers that re will release neurotransmitters glutamate and substance P, and some pain impulses are blocked by an inhibitory endogenous opioid like endorphins. Pain tolerance, um, we all perceive pain at the same stimulus intensity, but our pain tolerance varies. Uh, sensitive to pain means low pain tolerance and not necessarily a low pain threshold. The, your genes will help determine your pain tolerance as well as your response to pain medication. And research is still um, ongoing into genetics how to best determine pain treatment. Visceral and referred pain are important. Visceral pain refers um, results from a stimulus of a visceral organ perception, reception. So it's felt as a vague, aching, gnawing, or burning, and it's activated by tissue, stretching, ischemia, chemicals, and muscle spasms. So visceral pain res result, results from um, stimulus from an internal visceral organ. Referred pain is when pain from one body region is perceived as coming from another region in the body. Visceral and somatic pain fibers always travel along the same nerve. So your brain will assume the stimulus is coming from a common region. So for an example of this, the telltale sign of a heart attack is pain coming from the left arm. So here's a map of referred pain where the uh, brain will sense that the pain is coming from, but it's actually not. So the heart, um, anything wrong with the heart could be felt in the left chest or all along the left side of the arm. Um, urinary bladder appendix, um, gallbladder, yeah, lungs and diaphragm can sometimes be felt in the upper neck region. So this is important for medical personnel to understand if someone is complaining of pain, uh, the actual source of the pain could be coming from somewhere else. And again, that's because the nerve fibers um, from the area of the skin that's being felt as pain and the visceral organ underneath, they all travel the same pathways. Long lasting or intense pain, such as a limb amputation, can lead to hyperalesia, which is pain amplification, chronic pain, or what we call phantom limb pain, where you have your receptors are being activated by long lasting or intense pain from the limb being cut off. And this allows the spinal cord to learn um, hyperalesia or that pain amplification. Uh, early pain management is critical to help prevent this. And phantom limb pain is when pain is felt in a limb that has been amputated. And now they are using epidural anesthesia during surgery to reduce this idea of phantom pain. Sensory receptors, again, are specialized to respond to changes in the environment. The awareness of stimulus is sensation and the interpretation of meaning of stimulus perception occurs in the brain. And there's three ways to classify receptors um, based on their type of stimulus their body location and structural complexity. And um, for these parts, I'm gonna let you guys read through this on your own. You are responsible for this, but these are classification of stimulus types. So you should know these types of receptors and then classified by their location. You should know where they're located, whether external to the body, internal to the body, or proprioceptors have to do um, with the brain's uh, movements of your skeletal muscle, tendons, joints, and ligaments in relationship to each other. And then the majority of sensory receptors belong to one or two categories, the simple receptors of the general senses, and then the receptors for special senses, um, vision, hearing, equilibrium, smell, and taste are all housed in complex sense organs. And we'll cover those in chapter 15. So here are simple receptors of the general senses. Um, they either have non-encapsulated free nerve endings or encapsulated nerve endings. And I'm going to let you guys read through the difference between the non-encapsulated and then the encapsulated nerve endings. And um, I skip over this a little quickly because I covered it in my anatomy. Um, some things like Merkel cells and discs 
these few slides that you see uh, really give you a great um, just kind of summary of the different types um, of general sensory receptors classified by, classified by their structure and function. Um, so I skip over this a little bit because you can review the slides and outside of reviewing um, these slides for this part of the PowerPoint is, is definitely um, probably sufficient. So we'll talk about the eye and we'll talk about hearing um, later on in the chapter, but we'll first talk, talk a little bit about the eye and how it hit its senses stimuli. So about 70% of your body's sensory receptors are in the eye. Half of your cerebral cortex is actually involved in visual processing. Um, your eye is a small sphere. Um, only one sixth of the surface is visible, what you see with the pupil iris and a sclera. Most of the eye is enclosed and protected by a fat cushion. And your eye consists of accessory structures and the eyeball, which, is, which are seen here. And I'm also going to skip over some of the eye and accessory structures. You should know these from anatomy. Um, and I could ask you a question on them, um, but please review the anatomy of the accessory structures of the eye. Um, review the anatomy of the inside of the eye as well. So here are all the accessory structures. We'll talk a little bit about this a homeostatic imbalance, first of all. Uh, cal calizion is an obstructed tarsal gland that could result in a firm, usually painless bump. And a sty is painful inflammation of any of the sebaceous glands at the base of the eyelash. And some of you might have experienced that at some time. More accessory structures of the eye, the conjunctiva is a transparent mucous membrane. Um, that is on the inside of your eyelids that helps to produce mucus to keep things clean. Conjectivus is inflammation of the conjunctiva resulting in a redder, irritated eye. And pink eye is an infection of the conjunctiva caused by bacteria or viruses. Pink eye is incredibly contagious. If you've ever had a kid at daycare, you know that if a kid has pink eye, um, you're really worried because your kid might get it soon. The lacrimal ad, ap apparatus is what produces tears, so also part of the accessory structure. Um, the lacrimal apparatus is important because the, your tears have mucus, antibodies, and an antibacterial lysozyme that always um, keeps your eyes very clean, which is important. And that's a look at the anatomy of the lacrimal apparatus. Your nasal cavity mucosa is continuous with the mucosa of the lacrimal duct, so a cold or nasal inflammation often causes your lacrimal mucosa to swell and swelling can constrict the ducts and prevent tears from draining, causing a watery eye. So if you get sick um, from a cold, uh, your eyes might become more watery. Okay, extrinsic eye muscles, you have six of them. Remember your eye muscles attach six of them to the top, bottom, left, right, um, and that oblique angles at the top and bottom. So these six extrinsic eye muscles allow your eye to move in um, a million different directions extremely quickly. So here's a look, a top view, and then a anterior view of the right eye and how the eye muscles attach. And here are the six extrinsic eye muscles and then their action, and then the controlling from which cranial nerve. Uh, diplopia is double vision. This occurs when movements of the external muscles of the two eyes are not perfectly coordinated. So the person cannot properly focus the images of the same area of the visual field from each eye. So it sees two images instead of one. Um, this can sometimes result from paralysis, extrinsic muscle weakness, or some sort of neuro neurological disorder. Strapismus means cross-eyed, and this is a congenital weakness of the external eye muscles where the eye rotates medially or laterally um, the eyes may alternate focusing on objects or only control. One eye is able to be controlled. The brain begins to disregard input from the deviant eye, which can become functionally blind uh, if not treated early. So here's the structures of the eyeball. Again, this is important to review. This is in, from anatomy. So I want you to review structures of the eye. Um, you should know these structures, the layers of the eye, the fibrous layer has your sclera and cornea. The vascular layer um, has your choroid region. So this is how your eye gets all blood vessels to it. The choroid, ciliary body, iris, um, the ciliary body, ciliary muscles, 
Um, and ex your ciliary zonule are, is also known as your suspensory ligaments that are coming from the ciliary body. The ciliary bodies is what is important with the suspensory ligaments um, to hold the lens in place. The iris then is the colored part of the eye um, with the pupil being the central opening, the black dot, and the pupil can open and close um, in response to stimuli from parasympathetic or sympathetic control. And this is usually a, by a change in some sort of emotional state. The pupil will often dilate when the subject matter is appealing or requires uh, problem solving skills. So here's the internal structures of the eye, a sagittal section. Um, and this is a good review. I do want you guys to um, pay attention to this. I do think I have at least one question on the test about this. Uh, pupil constriction and pupil dilation. So um, your pupils will constrict due to parasympathetic control. So parasympathetic control, and we'll talk about this, is a part of the rest and digest division. So you have sphincter pupillae muscles, which will constrict, and the pupil will decrease in size. And then during sympathetic control, um, with an increase in sympathetic activity, this is your fight or flight response. So your pupil will dilate. So your fight or flight response means that the pupil will want to take in as much light as possible um, to fight or flight for the body to respond. And you can see here, uh, you have dilator pupil muscle contracting and the dilator pupil muscle, um, you can see dilates the pupil and the constrictor pupil muscle will constrict the pupil. And you can see the two muscles are part of your iris. Then we have our inner layer, which is the retina. Um, the retina will contain the photoreceptor cells that will transduce the light energy, the neurons, the glial cells, and it has a delicate two-layered membrane of an outer pigmented layer and an inner neural layer. So this is your retina. We are gonna focus a little more on the retina because we're gonna talk about the photoreceptors because we're a little more in physiology to figure out how everything works. So you can see here the retina, um, the neural layer, the pigmented layer, the choroid and the sclera. And you can see here the optic nerve will contain all of the neurons that are going to and from um, the layers of the pigmented layer, which contains your photoreceptor cells. So the pigmented layer of the retina um, is a single layer thick next to the choroid. It functions to absorb light and prevent its scattering. And it also phagocytizes photoreceptor cell fragments. So it kind of like is the cell recycling area. And it also stores vitamin A. So that's the pigmented layer of the retina. And then the neural layer of the retina, I spoke before, the neural layer of the retina is the transparent layer. It's composed of three main types of neurons. So you should know this. Your neural layer contains your photoreceptor cells, your bipolar cells, and your ganglion cells. The signals will spread from your photoreceptors to the bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells, and then the ganglion cells will actually axon, exit um, as axons exit the optic nerve. The optic disc is the site where the optic nerve leaves the eye. It doesn't have any photoreceptors in its location, so it's referred to as the blind spot. And your retina has um, about a quarter billion photoreceptors that are either rods or cones. And again, here's a look at the neural layer, um, and then the pigmented layer, the choroid and the sclera. The rods are important for detecting dim light. These are per your peripheral vision receptors. They're more sensitive to light than cones. Uh, they do not help with color vision or sharp images. Their numbers are greatest at the periphery of the retina. And then your cones are your vision receptors for bright light, for color vision, the macula lutea is the area at the posterior pole of the eye, just lateral to the blind spot. This contains mostly cones. And the fovea centralis is a tiny pit in the center of the macula lutea that contains all of your cones. So it's the region with best visual act acuity. And your eye will actually move to allow you to focus on an object so that the object is directly placed on the fovea in the back of the eye. So here's a look at the microscopic anatomy of the retina. Here's the axons of the ganglion cells, the ganglion cells, the bipolar cells, and then the photoreceptors, either your rods and cones. So I want you to understand well, um, the pathway of light comes all the way through to the back of the eye first and bounces off this pigmented layer. 
And then the pathway of signal output travels through your rods and cones, through your bipolar cells, and through your ganglion cells to eventually get picked up by the axons of the ganglion cells, and then it exits out of the eye um, through the optic nerve. So here's a microscopic anatomy of the retina, an actual visual photomicrograph, which is kind of cool to see as well. So the inner layer of the retina, you have two sources of blood supply to the retina, your choroid vessels and your central artery, which exits and enters in the center of the optic nerve. The vessels are only visible in a living person. Um, so this is a really uh, popular view that you'll get if you go to an um, optometrist. You can see the macula lutea is directly lateral to the optic disc. So again, this is the lateral side of the retina, the medial side. You can see the central arteries and veins emerging from the center of the optic disc. Retinal detachment is a condition where the pigmented and neural layers will separate or detach, allowing the jelly-like vitreous humor to seep between them. This can lead to permanent blindness, and it usually happens when the retina is torn during any sort of traumatic blow to the head or sudden stopping of the head during movement, like bungee jumping. So maybe think twice about going to bungee jumping. Um, the symptom is described by victims as a curtain being drawn across the eye or spot like flashes. And the treatment is to reattach the retina with laser surgery. So more some anatomy structures of the eye. We have your posterior segment and the anterior segment of some internal chambers and fluids. The posterior segment contains vitreous humor, which is a little more jelly-like um, to support the posterior surface of the lens. Um, and one interesting thing to note is that the vitreous humor forms in the embryo and then it lasts your whole lifetime, which is kind of cool to think about. And then the internal chamber, um, we have your anterior segment, which so you have your iris, which divides the anterior segment into two chambers, the anterior chamber, which is between your cornea and iris, and then the posterior chamber between your iris and lens. And the entire segment is filled with aqueous humor, um, which is continuously formed by the capillaries of the ciliary processes. So here's a look at the circulation of aqueous humor uh, between the anterior segment and the posterior segment, um, anterior to the eye. Glaucoma is a condition in which drainage of aqueous humor is blocked, causing the fluid to back up and increase pressure within the eye. So glaucoma, think pressure. So pressure increases, it can lead to dangerous levels which could compress the retina and the optic nerve leading to blindness. And symptoms, um, few are early, but late signs include seeing halos around lights and blurred vision. Um, detection can be an intraocular pressure determined by directing the puff of air at the cornea and measuring the amount of corneal deformation. And the test should be done yearly after the age 40. Treatment are eye drops that increase the rate of aqueous humor drainage or decrease its production and laser therapy or surgery layer later. So here's some structures of the eyeball that has to do with your lens. It's the biconcave, convex, transparent, flexible, and avascular structure. Lens fibers are continuously added, so lens becomes more dense, convex, and less elastic with age. So because the lens becomes less elastic with age, that's why when you get older, you need reading glasses because your lens is unable to focus on things close. Uh, the clouding of the lens comes from a consequence of aging, diabetes, mellitus, heavy smoking, or frequent ex exposure to intense light. Some of it is congenital. Um, crystalline proteins, clump, vitamin C can increase cataract formation, and the lens can, could be replaced surgically with an artificial lens. And we're gonna jump right into part B as well. Uh, because this part B will be a continuation of part A that has to do with the eye. So again, we're in the eye right now, and a lot of this is some review from anatomy. Um, so let's continue on with part B. We're into the optics of the eye, and we'll talk a little bit about um, light and optics, wavelength color, electromagnetic radiation has to do with all the energy waves from long radio waves to short x-rays, and visible light, which is what we can see, occupies only a small portion in the middle of the spectrum. And light has wavelengths between 400 and 700 nanometers. And the eye can only respond to visible light. So wavelength and color. Light 
is packets of energy that travel in wavelength fashions at high speeds. And when your visible light passes through a spectrum, it's broken into bands of color called the visible spectrum. Red wavelengths are longest and have the lowest energy and violet waves are shortest and have the most energy. The color that the eye is perceives is a reflection of that wavelength. So grass is green because it absorbs all colors except green. White actually reflects all colors and black absorbs all colors. So this is just the electromagnetic spectrum and your photoreceptor sensitivities. And you have rods and different colored cones that will absorb um, different uh, colors of light. Refraction and lenses. Refraction has to do with the bending of light rays. So refraction just means bending of light rays due to the change of speed when light comes in, it passes from one transport, transparent medium to another and the light will bend. The light bends through the lens. So the lens and the eyes can refract or bend the light because both sides are curved. You have a convex, um, which refers to that it's thicker in the center than the edges. And concave means it's thicker at the edges than in the center. Convex lenses will bend the light passing through so the rays converge at a focal point and the image will be formed at the focal point. It will be upside down and reversed from left to right. And concave lenses will disperse the light, preventing light from being focused. So here's an example focusing of two points of light um, how when they go through um, illustration A, a convex lens has two focal points, one on each side, they're equal distance from the lens. They'll, they'll have corresponding point sources on the other side of the lens, but they'll always be upside down from their corresponding point of focus. And illustration B shows that the image will always be inverted through a convex lens. It shows that it's upside down and inversed. And this lens is what we have in our eyes. So it'll um, upside down and reverse the images that your um, eye takes in. So they'll be always be inverted as they're focused on the back of the eye. So as light, the pathway of light entering the eye, you should know it goes through your cornea, aqueous humerus, lens, vitreous humor, entire neural layer of the retina. Light will be bent and will refracted three times along the path. One, as it enters the cornea, two, as it enters the lens, and then as it leaves the end. So it'll be bent or refracted three times. The majority of the refractory power is in the cornea. However, it's constant and cannot change its focus. So focusing for distant vision, eyes are best adapted for distant vision. The far point of vision is the distance beyond which no change in the lens shape is needed. And it's 20 feet for a normal eye or emetropic. The cornea and the lens will focus light precisely on the retina at this distance, 20 feet. Your ciliary muscles will be completely relaxed in distant vision, which causes a pull on the ciliary zonule or those suspensory ligaments as a result. So the lens stretches flat. So this is one part that I do want you guys to know. Uh, the ciliary muscle and the ciliary zonule or ligaments will focus an image by changing the shape of the lens. Uh, the ciliary muscles will contract and that'll loosen uh, the zonual fibers and relaxation will tighten them. So as we see here um, in these two slides, I'm going to focus your attention on this slide that describes focusing for um, distant vision. So the lens will flatten for distant vision. That means that sympathetic input relaxes the ciliary muscle which tightens the ciliary zonule and flattens the lens. So this is what happens to the lens during distant vision, it becomes flat. Then focusing on close objects uh, requires the eye to make active adjustments called accommodation where it changes the lens shape to increase bending or refraction. And the near point of vision refers to the closest point on which the eye can focus. Presbyopia refers to the loss of accommodation, accommodation over the age of 50, so the inability to focus on things close. The focusing for close vision then uh, uh, refers to this chart, and I'll focus your attention on this. So this is what happens to the lens during close vision. Parasympathetic input contracts the ciliary muscle. This loosens the ciliary zonule or those suspensory ligaments, and it allows the lens to bulge. So again, for distant vision, the lens will flatten 
And for close vision, the lens, the lens will bulge. And I want you to know those two things, what happened to the lens very well. You should be familiar with these terms, myopia, hyperopia, and astigmatism. Um, these are problems associated with refraction related to the eyeball shape. Myopia is nearsightedness where the eyeball is too long. So the focal point is in the front of the retina. It's usually corrected with a concave lens, which you get from your glasses or uh, the contact lens. And then hyperopia is farsighted vision. The um, eyeball is too short, so the focal point is behind the retina. And this is corrected with a convex lens. Astigmatism is unequal curvatures in different parts of cornea or the lens, and it's corrected with cylindrically ground lenses or later major procedures. So just in a review, um, what we, most of us have is myopia, uh, nearsightedness, and that just means that we have trouble seeing things far away. So keep understand well the difference between myopia and hyperopia. When you hear someone say they're nearsighted, um, they have problems seeing things far away. Functional anatomy of photoreceptors. So we'll get now a little bit back to photoreceptors. Um, we'll talk a little bit about their functional anatomy. So your photoreceptors, again, are the rods and cones that are the modified neurons that they resemble upside down epithelial cells with their tips embedded in the pigmented layer. Um, so this is a look at our photoreceptors. Again, we have rods and cones, and as light enters the retina, it passes down the process of bipolar cells, inner fibers, and synaptic terminals. But these rods and cones have different um, features. The cell body is connected to a synaptic terminal via the inner fibers, and these visual photopigments are then embedded in discs, and the pigments are what will change shape as they absorb light. Photoreceptors are vulnerable to damage. They can degenerate if your retina is detached. They're destroyed by intense light and vision is maintained because the outer segment is renewed every 24 hours. So comparing rod and cone vision, rods are very sensitive to light, making them best suited for night vision and peripheral vision. And the rods contain a single, single pigment, so vision is perceived in a gray tone only. The pathways will always converge, causing fuzzy, indistinct images. This is important to note. Um, rods are important just for uh, night vision and peripheral vision because many rods could converge onto one ganglion. And I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. Cones have low sensitivity, so they require bright light for activation. Cones react much more quickly than rods. It could have one of three pigments, which allow for vividly colored sight. Um, and cones have non-converging pathways, which mean each cone converges on one uh, ganglion cell. So they result in detailed high resolution vision. And this is a good um, comparison of rods and cones chart, which you should, it's a great way. These charts, charts I like because they give you a good kind of study mechanism and study tool. Color blindness is the lack of one or more cone pigments. It's usually is inherited as an X-linked condition, so more common in males. The most common type is red-green, in which either red cones or green cones are absent, and it depends on which cone is missing. Red can appear green or vice versa, and it relies on different shades to get cues of color. Retinol then is the key light absorbing molecule uh, that combines with one of four proteins to form visual pigments. Um, so the retinol, um, I'm going to skip over some of this you don't need to know. Phototransduction is how um, the process by which your pigments in your photoreceptors will capture the photon of light energy, which will then be converted into a graded receptor potential. So phototransduction just means you're taking in light and the pigments from light and then transferring that into electrical energy. Um, the deep purple pigment of rods is rhodopsin. And um, you don't need to know much more than that, but this is the process of phototransduction, capturing the light um, using the formation and breakdown of rhodopsin in the rods. Light transduction reactions, this again, is taking those pigments and turning them into electrical energy. It uses a lot of second messengers and you don't need to know all of these um, 
in terms of that information processing in the retina. Um, photoreceptors and bipolar cells generate only created potentials, not action potentials. And this is how those created potentials are generated. So this takes you through again, how uh, basically, again, how your eye takes in light and transfers it into an electrical impulse that's then taken up by your ganglion cells and exits the eye out of the axon of those ganglion cells. And again, I won't ask you guys specifics, uh, for this. Light and dark adaptation, uh, rhodopsin is sensitive, um, that bleaching occurs even in starlight. Cones respond better to bright light, uh, so activation of rods and cones depends on just light and dark adaptation. This takes you through light and dark adaptation and what that means. I won't ask you guys the differences between the two. Nick Telopia is night blindness. It's, this is a condition in which rod function is seriously hampered. Um, so the ability to drive safely at night is impaired. And this is due to rod degeneration, um, sometimes caused by prolonged vitamin A deficiency. And it can also be caused by retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative retinal disease that destroys rods where the tips of your rods are not replaced when they slough off. So the visual processing to the brain. So the visual pathway of the brain, your axons of the ganglion cells exit the eye via the optic nerve. The medial fibers from each eye cross over at the optic chasm that continue on as optic tracts, which means that each optic tract contains fiber, fibers from the lateral and medial aspects of the same side and the opposite side of the eye. And I'll show you a picture of what that means. Each carries information from the same half of the visual field. Most fibers of your optic traps will continue on to the lateral geniculate nuclei of the thalamus. Remember the thalamus is what receives all sensory input. And then from there, your thalamus will send it out into the appropriate lobes of the brain, specifically your occipital lobe, which takes care of your conscious perception of visual images. Other optic tracts um, go to the midbrain. A small substance of these cells contain melanopopsin, which will project things to different nuclei of the hypothalamus. So this is just the visual pathway of the brain. And what uh, I was meaning before by the eye fields, you can see here that each eye takes in, um, um, if both eyes take in vision from the same kind of central eye field. And then from the right eye only and from the left eye only, um, this kind of gives you your peripheral vision because they will take in images from the right and left side and those go into the right and left eye only. And you can see here how different um, aspects of the visual field travel through their different tracks to cross over at the optic chasm and then go on to their areas of the um, tracks. Depth perception is when both eyes view the same image from slightly different angles. So this gives you depth perception and it requires input from both eyes. The loss of an eye or destruction of one optic nerve can eliminate true depth perception entirely because your peripheral image vision on the damaged side is also affected. If neural destruction occurs beyond the optic chasm, then the part or all of the opposite opposite half of the visual field is lost. So an example of this is in stroke. So stroke can affect your left visual cortex, which leads to blindness in the right half of the visual field. Visual processing then, your retinal cells are split um, into channels that include information about color and brightness. Um, visual processing travels on into the primary visual cortex, which contains the topographic map up the retina and info can be passed on to your temporal, parietal, and frontal lobes where objects can be identified and the location and space can be determined. So you have lots of the areas of the brain helping um, with vision processing. We'll end this PowerPoint a little bit talking then about receptors in your olfactory epithelium and taste buds. So olfaction and gustation are complementary senses that let us know where a substance should be savored or avoided. Chemoreceptors are very important in these systems. Your olfactory epithelium and olfactory stem cells are important for olfaction. And this is the location of your olfactory receptors 
um, coming from your olfactory tract of your olfactory nerve, uh, coming down in through uh, the top half of your nose. The location and structure of your olfactory receptors, um, they're coming from olfactory nerve, cranial nerve number one, and olfactory neurons, unlike other neurons, have stem cells that give rise to new neurons every 30 to 60 days. And this is a look at your olfactory receptors. So they travel through the cribriform plate, if you remember that from anatomy, and then they enter into the olfactory cilia and epithelium, um, which will contain mucus, which is what air will pass through. Specificity of olfactory receptors. Um, smells are made up of hundreds of different odorants and humans have about 350 odorant receptors. So you're able um, to detect uh, many different types of smells. Pain and temperature receptors are also in your nasal cavities and they will respond to irritants like ammonia or it can smell hot or cold like chili peppers or menthol. You might sense that sensation. You actually can smell uh, temperature. The physiology of smell, I want, and we're not going to talk too much about the physiology of smell because I want you to focus more on eye and vision. Um, in order to smell a substance, though, it must be volatile. So it must be in a gaseous state. And then it travels through smell transduction. And again, whenever you see the word transduction, that just means taking um, the odorant and turning it into an electrical. So we get another kind of event of phototransduction similar to the olfactory pathway, um, which will take it into the olfactory tracts, into your olfactory cortex. Um, one pathway brings information to the frontal lobe, another is sent to your hypothalamus and other areas of the brain. Anosmias is the olfactory disorders, which result from head injuries that could tear your olfactory nerves, uh, may be caused by a neurolog neurological disorder like Parkinson's disease, or Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's hallucinations are sometimes common where it's usually caused by temporal lobe epilepsy, um, usually involved with some sort of seizure. Then we'll get to taste. So you have most of your 10,000 taste buds are located on your tongue in papillae. And these are your three different types of papillae that I want you guys to review from anatomy. Some are on their soft palate, your cheeks, your pharynx, epiglottis. So here are the location and the, where your papillae are so the location and structure of taste buds, um, here's a look at a taste bud. Remember that taste buds are actually within these valleys of the papillae. So the papillae on the tongues are bumps and your taste buds are actually within the valleys of those papillae. So here's a look at the taste buds, um, the taste pore, which will take in um, the taste chemical, and then that will be translated um, through these gustatory epithelial cells eventually into taste fibers of the cranial nerve to be picked up so that the taste is sent to the brain and then perceived. Here are the five basic taste sensations that we can all taste, so you can review those on your own. There's a possible six taste, don't worry too much about that. The physiology of taste, um, so to be able to taste a chemical, it must be able to be dissolved first, diffused into the taste pore, and then contact the gustatory hairs. The activation of taste receptors again then comes through this pathway that leads to taste transduction. So again, the gustatory epithelial cell is depolarized, leads to an influx, um, opening or closing of channels to allow, um, we kind of have this pathway that gets us from a chemical to eventually a transduction signal that goes to our brain. Two main cranial nerves pair together to carry taste impulses from the tongue to the brain. Your facial and your glossopharyngeal nerve and your vagus nerve also transmits um, from the epiglottis and the lower pharynx. Fibers synapse in the solitary nucleus in the medulla that travel to the thalamus and then travel to the gustatory cortex, which again is in the insula. So your brain is able to determine what you're actually tasting. There are some taste disorders. Um, Causes of taste disorders include upper respiratory tract infections, head injuries, chemicals, medications, uh, COVID. If you've had COVID, you lose your sense of smell and taste. So that will affect uh, this pathway of the brain as well. So we'll stop that from here for this lecture PowerPoint. And then the second lecture will go through parts um, C, D, and E of this chapter. Thanks for listening, guys.